And if you're interested in more of our activities, more webinars, we're getting a lot more in coming through now. Please look at our new website, tfa.net, um, which has just been revamped and has details of our acti activities and people involved. Um, tonight, we're addressing the very important issue of cancel culture as part of our free speech initiative. Um, you know, there's a lot of threats going on to free speech. Um, and uh, we're delighted with the uh, guests we got along tonight, um, including the Free Speech Union, of course, with Toby Young and others. Um, but I just wanted to start by um, looking at the definition of cancel culture, just to be clear on that. Um, it's basically, as I call it, the old fashioned bullying or shunning or ostracizing someone, um, often on social media. Um, but it is defined as the popular practice of withdrawing support, uh, bracket cancelling public figures or companies after they have said or done something which is considered to be objectionable or offensive. So that is cancel culture. Uh, we've got some great speakers along tonight, um, and we're going to ask um, Nick Buckley, who's had direct experience of cancel culture, to set the scene. Uh, Nick has done great work with the Mancurian Way, uh, helping the homeless, um, and had quite an experience recently, unfortunately, be because of some of the use he expressed. Um, but he's going to just explain what happened, just to set the scene on cancel culture. Um, we have Claire Fox joining us later, by the way. She's, uh, she's just getting to question time. She's on tonight. I was going to quip that actually we'll likely have a larger audience tonight than question time, the way things are going. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, she will join us. Um, but I'll ask uh, Nick to go ahead and then I'll introduce the others as, as we go. Thanks, Nick. Hello, um, thank you for the opportunity this evening to talk about uh, cancel culture. So where do I start? Um, so I have been running a charity for 10 years and before that I spent another 10 years working for a local authority. I've spent two decades helping young people, homeless people across Greater Manchester. And then in the summer this year, we had the tragic death of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter hit public consciousness. And I've never really heard of Black Lives Matter, the organisation, before spring, summer this year. So I went online, Googled who they were, what they were about, and was quite surprised uh, on what I discovered. I read their website and I thought to myself, this doesn't seem like an anti-racist movement um, organisation to me. It comes across as a Marxist organisation. I asked a couple of friends what they thought and they'd never heard of it as well. They just thought it was a movement about racism and racism in the UK. So I wrote a uh, six, 700 word blog, posted it on LinkedIn about what I discovered talking about their Marx, Marxist ideology and what they should be aiming for in the UK if they wanted to improve the lives of black people living in the UK. It was fine for the first couple of weeks on LinkedIn. Um, some people disagreed with me, um, but politely, other people phoned me up and said, oh, I read that, really enjoyed it. I agree with you, but I'm not going to put that online because I may get into trouble. And I remember thinking at the time, why would you get into trouble about expressing your views? Obviously, I was a little bit na naive at that point. And then a couple of days later, someone copied the link off LinkedIn and put it on Twitter. And then that's when it all went crazy then. Within days, there was a petition to have me fired from the charity I founded. 450 people signed that petition. Another half dozen people emailed the board saying, you've got a Nazi running your charity, you need to sack him. And within three, four days, the board, who never spoke to me, I had two emails off the board over this. And the second email was, you sat, you terminated immediate effect. And I remember walking out of the office thinking, what's happened here? I, I wrote a blog, which I've wrote many blogs on many subjects that I think is important that people need to understand. And all of a sudden, because of some people on Twitter, I've now been fired from my own charity. But what happened had happened. And I took it on the chin, what else can you do? 
And over the next couple of days, over the next week, um, there was a little bit of self-pity and a little bit of licking my wounds and thinking I made a mistake and, you know, I should keep my big mouth shut, which, to be honest, lots of people have said that to me many times over many decades. And then I decided one morning, no, I'm not having this. If I'm going to move forward now, I need to clear my name. I can't have people thinking I was sacked from a charity because I'm racist. So I decided I was going to launch a fight back and claim my name. One of the first things I did was I joined Free Speech Union um, and I had a fantastic conversation with Toby. So first time I think me and Toby's looked at each other over the same screen. So thank you, Toby, for the hour and a half you spent with me that day talking to me. It really helped. Um, it didn't solve anything, but it, it was the first time in you know a week, 10 days, I got it off my chest. I spoke to somebody who knew how it felt to have your life ripped apart and to feel helpless and to and to have your friends and your family care about you, but nobody wants to say anything online because they're afraid as well. Because look what happened, look what happened to me. Of course they were afraid. And then I spoke to the mail on Sunday and uh, got national attention. And then I just kept on speaking. I kept going online. I kept doing interviews. And I thought someone needs to speak up. I'd already been a coward for the first seven days, but I'm not going to be a coward anymore. And I was surprised how easy it was and how easy it was to defeat these people. So the second I got national attention, from that day onwards, nobody ever criticised me again on social media. Not one person ever, ever again criticised me because suddenly I was in a bigger team then. They were being afraid. They were afraid of being bullied by the bigger crowd. And then I turned my eyes then to the board and I thought, right, I already know something about the board. You don't like pressure. You don't like attention. You don't like being criticized. So then I flipped the tables. I thought, I'll give you pressure. I'll give you attention. I'll criticize you. And then with the help with the Free Speech Union, we got a solicitor on board. He looked at the case, um, fantastic solicitor called um, Jeffrey Davis, looked at all my paperwork and my contract and went, clear breach of contract this so he wrote to the board and within 18 hours of them getting the letter they capitulated and and they said we'll resign so my two enemies at the time the online mob disappeared once i got national attention and the board who didn't have the backbone to stick up to a personal friend stick up for a personal friend they gave up after 18 hours and i think that's the lesson to learn from my case is these people can be beat but not only can they be beat they can be beat a lot easier than we possibly can imagine. And, and that's my story. Nick, thanks so much. It's a very much a personal story, but it does illustrate uh, the, the main themes. Um, I mean, you, you've got like the National Trust doing some very odd things, you know, on, on statues, for example, and saying Churchill is, uh, they're trying to disown Churchill and all of that. Uh, and as you say, the pressure point, I think, is a very important point. And, and, and you know, you've shown a lot of courage and guts. Um, if we may just now go to Toby, um, Toby Young, who set up the Free Speech Union in February and is doing a great job on, on free speech, Toby. And, you know, many congratulations. And I understand you're a proper union in the sense you, <laughs> you represent members, you know, and, and fight for them. And um, that's a good example. Um, I really commend what you've done. As I say, the Freedom Association is very into free speech uh, and defending it. It seems to be under attack from all, all angles. So thank you, Toby. I know you've done some great work in the past as well on free schools and the educational world, which, which is really valuable. Uh, and of course, have been a successful journalist uh, as well. So could you just um, speak on council culture for us and, and, and what you're doing at the Free Speech Union on that? Sure, David, yes. Um, well, it's great to, uh, to hear Nick talk about his experience and it's great to hear about the happy ending. Um, uh, I think, unfortunately, for, for every person we're able to help, you know, there are 99 people who are the victims of cancel culture who we haven't been able to help. Um, uh, so one of the things I want to do is make the existence of the Free Speech Union more widely known. Um, it doesn't cost much to join. Um, if you're uh, a pensioner or on benefits or a student, it's only £25 a year. 
otherwise it's 50 pounds a year and if you do get into trouble um uh, as nick did um we really can do a number of things to help up to and including um finding you pro bono legal help not in every case but in some cases um uh, and my reason for setting it up david was in part because I went through a similar experience to the one Nick went through at the beginning of 2018 when uh, Theresa May appointed me as one of 15 non-executive directors to uh, the Office for Students, a new education regulator that had just been created. It was a pretty nothing job, no big deal. Um, you know, not the sort of thing you do uh, for the glory. Uh, it was an unpaid position. It involved no. sitting on a bunch of committees. And as I say, I was one of 15 people uh, on the board of this new regulator. Uh, but um, it was spun by um, enemies of the Conservative government and of Theresa May's as an example of the Conservative Party handing this plum job to one of their chums. I was described as Theresa May's university's czar, which really couldn't have been further from the truth. Um, but that prompted a kind of outrage mob to form up on social media. Uh, they started going through everything I'd said or written, dating back in one case to something I'd written in 1987. So 31 years earlier, uh, I called them uh, offense archeologists sifting through your past to look for evidence of offensiveness and they and they claim that these supposedly offensive things you've said um are um really dangerous and are going to trigger people into behaving in a hateful way this is what they said about boris when people complained about the joke he made about burka wearing women in that infamous mm -hmm. telegraph column the claim was that merely making this joke would trigger some people into committing hate crimes against Muslim women. It was that dangerous and that's why he should be silent. And you think, well, if you really believe that, why are you dredging the joke up again and repeating it ad infinitum on every single media platform? If you really think that merely hearing this joke, almost like that joke in the Monty Python sketch that is unleashed, I think on the first world war battlefield. If you really think this joke is so dangerous that it's going to cause people to kind of commit these frenzied hate crimes as soon as they hear it and turn into kind of wild animals on the street attacking Muslims hither and thither. Why repeat it over and over and over again? It shows that actually they don't think that for a second. They're just looking for ammunition that they can use to discredit you. And in my case, it was successful. After eight days, I had to step down from the Office for Students and um, I, I issued an apology, which I thought naively would draw a line under the whole affair. In fact, um, that was like throwing um, a hunk of raw meat to a shoal of piranha fish. Um, they then kind of um, uh, became blood crazed and went after me in four other positions. I ended up losing five positions in total as a result of my um, uh, 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 experience of cancel culture, including my full-time job running a free schools charity. Um, and like Nick said, um, when, it, when it happens to you, um, uh, you sort of hope that your friends will stand up for you um, uh, and your allies in the media will come to your defense. And in my case, some did, but not very many. Um, and, um, and it's because, you know, they see what's happening to you and they don't want to put their head over the parapet for fear that they'll get it in the neck too. Uh, and you do feel quite isolated and alone and you don't know quite who to turn to for advice, for legal advice, for PR advice. You know, you're sort of wondering, well, if I apologize, is that gonna help uh, or is that just gonna make things worse? And you don't know who to ask those sorts of questions of and you do feel, quite alone and it is quite traumatic and several people who've been through one of these experiences um, have ended up um, committing suicide. I can think of at least half a dozen. Um, in my case, um, it, it, it was never anything like that bad. You know, I've got a, I'm happily married. I've got four kids. Um, it wasn't a sex scandal. So my domestic uh, uh, life wasn't affected in any way. Um, so I was able to get through it. Um, uh, uh, but I felt afterwards that um, it would be great had there been an organization when that was happening to me that I could have turned to for advice and support. If there could have been someone I could have just spoken to about what I was going through, just as I was able to speak to Nick. Um, and that was really the sort of wellspring of the Free Speech Union. And, and that's really what we hope to do when, when people find themselves in the crosshairs of an outrage mob who are demanding that they be fired from their job 
pushed out of polite society, socially ostracized, and when not many people are coming to their defense, I like to think that we're there for them. We can we can come to their support. We can offer them the kind of support that Nick clearly needed, that I needed when I went through that experience. And and I just hope to let as many people as possible know that that if they do find themselves in, in what can be a very unpleasant and traumatic situation, there now is an organization out there that is geared up to help them. No, well, thanks very much, David. I just before we move on to other speakers, I mean, who who are they? Um, you know, who are these people? Are they organised? Is is it the same kind of people that attack Nick that attack you? Uh, you know, who, who's behind this? Uh, what's really driving it? Yes. Um, well, um, I think it's tempting, particularly when you see your life being systematically uh, torn apart, to imagine that there is this kind of bunker somewhere where uh, the enemies of free speech are assembled deciding who to pick out next um who to pick off um but i don't think it does work like that i think it, it's i think social media particularly twitter provides people with a platform that can spontaneously be exploited um, you know, they create a hashtag people just pile on spontaneously there is no kind of um big brother organization out there carrying out this surveillance and 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 recommending people for termination should they say the wrong thing it's a kind of crowdsourced big brother i'm afraid to say it's a largely spontaneous phenomenon and i think it's to do with uh social media being relatively young people overestimating the importance of things they see on social media i mean in nick's case someone i think uh, the people who disliked what he'd said about black lives matter started a petition on change.org only got 400 signatures but from from the point of view of the trustees they thought oh this is this is a movement this is the voice of the people speaking you know we have to listen whereas in fact it's just a few committed activists who who know how to kind of uh, whip up an outrage mob uh, and uh, amplify its voices use the megaphone that social media provides to give them outsized power no thank you very much um I was now going to uh, turn to Claire, um, who I should give her full title now, Baroness um, Fox. And uh, delighted for you, Claire, for um, and congratulations on uh, going to the Lords. Um, uh, Baroness of Buckley, uh, Fox of Buckley. Um, you've headed the Institute of Ideas very successfully um, and been Brexit party. I was very pleased to see you uh, in that capacity. Um, and um, uh, you've you come from interesting background, you know, on the Marxist side, which which gives a, a good balance to the panel as well, you know. And um, I'd be delighted to hear your perspective of council culture and what you think what you think of it. Also, how we combat it like, is, you know, how do we fight back on this? So uh, over to you, Claire. and thank you also because I know you're on the way or you're there at question time. So. I was joking earlier, maybe we'll get a, a bigger audience now you're on <laughs> and uh, or a bigger audience here on our uh, webinar. Over to you. Uh, well, that's a, that's that in and of itself is an interesting uh, question about question time, because I've um, been there's been about four or five occasions in the last six months where I've been trending because it's been announced that I was on a programme. So not anything I said, yeah. but just the fact that I'd been invited. Mm. And I think this is how cancel culture works. I, I've never been, I've not been cancelled, but just how it works. I remember when I was doing any questions, I mean, the vitriol with which the presenter and the producer were treated on social media for having invited me on. I couldn't understand why I was telling because I kept thinking it was a really dull programme. I said anything, am I? But actually, I then read it all, and of course, they weren't saying she said this, it was outrageous. They were saying the BBC shouldn't have her on. And the way I think it works is that you can imagine that the next time any questions wondered about whether they should have her on, the presenter and the producer would say, for God's sake, I'm not going to go through that again. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's too much. So an atmosphere is created around individuals that makes it more awkward than not to have you appear. That's it. It's not even, it's quite 
and that's not exactly subtle, but you know, if it just becomes a pain, I, I think I said it to Toby, I've certainly said it to other people. I have to now regularly message people and say, I can't support you in public because if I do, it'll make it worse. Because if I retweet and say I support somebody, they then get all my hate people going down. The road. It's like sort of last thing anyone needs is that to occur. So yeah. anyway, that's that's sort of an aside. So I think the biggest problem, which Toby alluded to, following on from from Nick, is that I I think that Nick's case was very important. In fact, as a beacon of bravery and of winning. But there's no doubt about it that the overall atmosphere is one of self-censorship. So I've just said that I don't always support people. I, I think that what happens is people become, they, they, they learn the lesson. So Nick wins, but on the other hand, I'll bet you that for all that Nick won, hundreds of heads of small charities who might have agreed with his original blog won't write blogs. Or their trustees will say, for God's sake, what you shouldn't do is write a blog, right? So it, the, the, it becomes a kind of warning sign. And it, whenever I talk about cancel culture, uh, people on social media are very keen to point out that I'm never off the bloody telly or the radio and I've not been canceled. But that's fine in a way if you've got a big platform I mean, I've not even got a big black, but if you're, you know, well known, you can get away with it. But what we're talking about is an atmosphere around every organization where people feel that if they say the wrong thing, they could get in trouble at work, that somebody will report them, that they will be demonized, that they will be labeled as Nick was with the vilest, you know, uh, uh, accusation of being a racist and a bigot, and you won't be able to get out of it. Um, I, I passed several people on to the Free Speech Union, but I know that in two instances of people I passed on, um, where they were, let's say, ordinary, you know, had ordinary jobs, you know, one public sector, one private sector, they had been branded as racist around Black Lives Matters as well, completely unfairly, actually because they were arguing against having to do mandatory. Uh, um, uh, unconscious bias training. But anyway, before the Free Speech Union even could defend them, their families told them to back off. Do you know what I mean? They kind of did it, you know, they basically backed off. They got frightened. And I don't blame them. I can understand it. They didn't want to be national figures. They were worried what would happen at work and so on and so forth. So one of the um, things that you say, how do we fight it? I think we've got to name this thing of self-censorship and, and, and as it were describe it and we also have to confront something that's very important at the moment which is the the notion that silence is violence that you have to actively be an ally because i think this enforced mandated speech which is a form of both it's not even just self-censorship it's demanding that people speak in bad faith you know demanding that you go and do unconscious bias training demanding that you sign up as an ally on Black Lives Matters because if you don't, you'll be a racist. You know, uh, those kind of things. That notion that you can't have freedom of conscience, never mind freedom of speech, is something I would like to make more of a fuss of. That's one thing. Um, uh, one thing that we should not do, but is very tempting, is attempt tit for tat. What, what, it's very tempting in cancel culture because people, for example, we've just, you know, Black Lives Matter is one of the examples we've used tonight. Because some of the people who, who and, and cancel culture got a lot of attention in the lockdown period around the uh, terrible killing of George Floyd and the, the subsequent then international furore about that. And then there was a kind of bit of a role and anyone who dared to not endorse a particular brand of anti-racism was uh, dubbed a, a bigot and so on. Um, I think that it seemed very one-sided. You know, the only people who have been cancelled were that, those people. So it becomes very tempting to then think, I really would like to get that sanctimonious 
journalist who led the witch hunt against so-and-so. I'd like to get her cancelled. And she said something stupid on social media. So let's all go for her. So you're going to get competing witch hunts. You know, let's get her sacked. And I, I understand it because there's a lot... There's a lot of people in my little black book of people that, you know, have tried to do me over that I wouldn't mind a certain amount of schadenfreude or if their reputations would be smirched. But actually, that's no way to live, is it? You know, I, I actually, what we should be doing is having debates with each other or, you know, yeah. dealing with each other politically. And then, and then the, the, the final thing I, I, I wanted to say, or I wanted to just tell a, a story which was about um, the Comment Awards uh, uh, um, media Awards in 2018, actually, Toby got me to write about this for Quillette at the time, but um, this was a, a, just a, you know, one of those endless journalistic awards, and um, I was one of the judges on it, and there was a Society and Diversity Award, I wasn't actually judging that category at all, by the way, um, and the um, Guardian journalists Gary Young and Nesreen Malik demanded that they were removed from the shortlist. So can you imagine, you're honoured, you're put on a shortlist, and they demanded that they were removed from the shortlist because Melanie Phillips was on the shortlist. But they only went public with that after they went to the organiser, Julia Hobsbawm, and demanded that Melanie Phillips was removed from the shortlist. And because Julia Hobsbawm wouldn't remove, because she'd been judged to be on the shortlist with them, they wouldn't remove, she wouldn't remove as the organiser Melanie Phillips. They didn't demanded that they, they weren't going to be on the shortlist. I mean, in a way, if you're on a shortlist, you can't demand to be taken off it. I mean, it's nonsense, right? <laughs> and then the next week, I mean, literally the next week, a judge, Helen, Helen Belcher from uh, Transmedia, one of the judges at this said uh, 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 media awards, she then demanded that she be removed as a judge because Janice Turner won the overall journalist of the year and she didn't approve of her. And she'd actually been on the judging panel, but she'd been outvoted and she demanded she'd be removed as a judge. The reason I'm using that example is because we've seen a lot of, uh, it was before the words cancel culture existed, even though it was only 2018, where you basically get people saying, I demand this person isn't published or this person and we've seen a lot more of that. And so I was just going to, to draw our attention to, obviously there's the example in, of Jordan Peterson, where the people who work for his publishing house, as we've all now heard, basically were demanding that the publishing, the publishers Penguin didn't publish his book and cried in the meeting and said a bit of publicity. Um, Jordan Peterson probably earns the publishers far too much money for them to take any notice. But I can assure you that there's a lot of people not getting published at the moment because staff teams, because you were asking who is it, who are they? The problem is they're often your colleagues at work. They're often ordinary staff in the publishing house. And the big thing that's hit the press in the last few days is obviously Suzanne Moore, where Suzanne Moore has been written about this, but where she is effectively driven out of The Guardian because fellow Guardian journalists refused to, I mean, you know, objected to what she, she wrote. And we've seen in America a number of sackings from newspapers because journalists on a newspaper have demanded that the editor of the newspaper should not have published such and such an article and somebody should be sacked. You know, in other words, I do think that this sort of, I, mean, I call it McCarthyism. I know that McCarthyism is a very specific historic moment and it's not quite that, but that, that sense of demanding who is allowed to speak, particularly yeah. in, and demanding that people are sacked, is a very serious problem for us. Yeah. It's widespread and is happening on the ground in non-Suzanne Moore headline things all the time. Not everybody's got JK Rowling um, as, as somebody who they also tried to get non-published. Yeah. Uh, but there, there's definitely a climate now, and which is why uh, Toby's free speech uh, union is so important and why Nick's winning that case was such an important moment as well. Thanks, thanks very much, Claire. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, I think a lot of it is like standing up to bullying, isn't it? It's, you know, if, if, if we can organise it and actually stand up to them, they, they often flake away. But um, I'm going to ask um, Andrew to speak now and then we'll go on to questions. 
Andrew does a great job at the Freedom Association um, and is head of campaigns and was previously of the Taxpayers Alliance um, and in his spare time as an organist when he's brought out in the church um, at Beverly in Yorkshire. So uh, over to you, Andrew. Thank you, David. <clears throat> My broadband connection this evening seems about as reliable as the broadband connection at uh, 10 Downing Street. So I hope that I can actually just stay online <laughs> for, for what I've got to say. But I mean, to answer the question, um, we, we've got to fight against it, which is why Nick's story is so important. Nick decided to, with the help of Toby and the Free Speech Union, to, to fight against this. And it's amazing how quickly they, those trustees buckled uh, and, under the pressure. But it sort of reminds me, I think something Margaret Thatcher once said, that when she leaves politics, she's going to set up a new company called rent a spine And it's... There's so many spineless organisations around, corporations around, who just as soon as they get a little bit of flack on social media, they're immediately trying to, to change policies or, or, or remove someone. And, you know, that, that is, a, I think, a, a huge problem. There's also the police as well. I mean, if we look at um, Darren Grimes' case, um, the police should have realised that that was a vexatious complaint. Of course he wasn't responsible. Of course he shouldn't have been pro uh, prosecuted. But they still went after him. Um, but I think was uh, saved um, Darren was, of course, Toby and the Free Speech Union again. But an absolute outpouring, outpouring of outrage on social media that I read, um, supporting uh, Darren. So I think I think that that is is important. Politicians have also got to take a, a lead in this. Um, Boris says that he's a libertarian. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure at the moment with all these different restrictions going on, but he says he's a libertarian. And, and there are others who are of uh, libertarian, classically liberal bent uh, on the back benches in, in the Conservative Party. They need to speak out against this. And we should be encouraging everyone to write to their MPs, raising these cases so they can raise this on the floor of, of, of the House of Commons. I think that that is, is vitally important too. I mean, if we, if we look at J.K. Rowling as, as an example, I mean, she is not going to be beaten because she's got the profile and she's got the money and she's clearly fighting uh, against these people. I believe she said that, um, that basically you call someone who has a period a woman, which I didn't think was a particularly controversial view, but of course she's had the, uh, the, the trans lobby uh, just pile on her. Um, and, you know, there's even been people wanting to burn J.K. Rowling's books. I mean, where's this taking us back to? Um, mm. it's, it's a terribly worrying situation. But J.K. Rowling is not going to be beaten. I think that's the, 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 that, that's, that's the important thing. She, she's not. So I think I just want to be quick, just in case my signal just go, goes completely, which I'm really fearful of. Um, I think we've all got to play our part uh, in, in, in fighting the cancel culture. Use social media effectively, lobby your MPs, write letters to the press, make your voices heard, because the majority of people in, in our country are against this. They, 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 they totally oppose it. And it's only a very small minority who are trying to get their way. And the more we fight against it, I think the more that we're going to win. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, I'll go on then to questions. I've got a, a, a couple of pre-submitted questions. If, if you don't mind, I'm just going to give you the three of them in one go, just for time's sake, um, and just to simplify them. From George Igler, um, basically simplifying, the, the council culture is bolstered by its laws, uh, UK laws. How can one arm of government now justify further tinkering with civil rights when another has already eliminated freedom of assembly this year, referring obviously to COVID? Um, Rupert Matthews, um, writing as a candidate to be a police and crime commissioner uh, in a county with three universities and more statues than you can share, shake a stick at, he's asking, how can the police help to push back council culture and promote free speech? So that's one of the, the, the policing of it. And then the third one is Kerry Ann Jones. Um, and she just makes the, the wider point that um, this can be very harmful. I mean, you know, one can look at it as a bit of a joke or uncomfortable, but she says that there have been examples of criminal cases, um, uh, you know, such as grooming, the grooming cases, um, where cancel culture, you know, anyone that actually raises concerns about certain behavior of grooming or 
um, uh, you know, or even terrorist activities um, is regarded as being racist and Islamophobic and a lot of other things. And the point is, this is a cancel culture in her view that is actually very damaging um, and is a bit like the Holy Inquisition and um, Galileo, as she, as, as she puts it. And I, I think it, it, maybe the panel could just touch on how damaging this can actually be. I mean, we mentioned suicides earlier, um, you know, which, which is awful. You know, Nick was saying six, and Toby, sorry, there's six people uh, known to have committed suicide because of the pressure. I just wonder if we can touch on those three and then we'll go to other questions. Uh, who, who wants to start? Um, do you want to start, Toby? Sure. Um... Yeah, well, to answer George's question, I mean, George makes a good point that um, our civil liberties have uh, been suspended and they've been suspended since March. Um, they were partially restored uh, in July, uh, but then they were suspended again in November. And now we're told they're going to be they're going to remain suspended until at least March of next year and possibly beyond. Um, and uh, one thing that the Free Speech Union is particularly concerned about is uh, the coronavirus guidance issued by Ofcom, the state broadcasting regulator, on the same day that um, Britain was placed under lockdown, March 23rd, um, essentially cautioning broadcasters to be extremely careful um, about ha having people on air that were critical of the government's handling of this crisis, of the advice being uh, disseminated by public health authorities like PHE, like the NHS. They didn't say you can't have these people on your programs, but if you do have them on your programs, exercise extreme caution. And then they let broadcasters know what they meant by reprimanding Eamon Holmes shortly after that um, for saying that he thought that even though the 5G conspiracy theory was plainly bonkers, nonetheless, people should be allowed to uh, uh, make that claim in the public square so it can be rebutted, so it can be the subject of public discussion. Um, but uh, Ofcom reprimanded him just for saying that people should be allowed to discuss this, not for endorsing the theory, uh, making it very clear what they were prepared to tolerate and what they weren't. I don't think that's been the largest factor in inhibiting a proper public conversation about how to respond to this pandemic, but I think it has been a factor. And um, the Free Speech Union is trying to judicially review that coronavirus guidance uh, because we think it's actually unlawful. We think it's a breach of Article 10 uh, as part of the um, European Convention on Human Rights, which protects freedom of expression. And we also think it's an example of Ofcom overreaching, uh, not doing what it was empowered to do by the Broadcasting Act. And the reason this is important is not just because there hasn't been a proper, fully informed, balanced discussion about how to respond to this pandemic. Most of the uh, what we see on the BBC, ITV Sky is very one sided. Um, it's important because uh, the government is minded to empower Ofcom uh, to become the Internet regulator, which means regulating social media. And the government published this paper uh, earlier this year called Online Harms, in which they proposed to give a regulator Ofcom, we think it's going to be um, the power to fine and in some cases jail social media executives if they don't remove certain content from social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, they don't remove it quickly enough. And they didn't just say they'll be obliged to remove unlawful content in this white paper. They also said it would be um, they, they would have to remove remove content that people found offensive. Yeah. Um, uh, so that that is going to have an extremely chilling effect on free speech. I mean, the social media companies, as we've seen during this crisis, don't need much encouragement in order to behave in a very high handed, censorious way and to uh, censor any dissent from the prevailing orthodoxy, particularly COVID orthodoxy. But if there's going to be this additional incentive for them to be even more censorious, I think uh, it, that's going to be really worrying, not least because, you know, the public square is places like Twitter and Facebook. This is where conversations, important conversations and debates take place. So if there is nobody holding the ring who believes in free speech, uh, that's extremely serious. But I'd like to flag up one more thing. I mean, let's hope that uh, by March or perhaps June of next year, um, uh, 
our civil liberties will have been largely restored. That doesn't mean we've no longer got anything to worry about. The Law Commission of England and Wales has just published um, uh, some recommendations, which it's currently consulting about, uh, uh, about how to, I think what it, it, I think it says it wants to tidy up hate crime law and hate speech law, as though this is a purely bureaucratic exercise. They just want to make the law a little bit less messy in these complicated areas. But actually what they're proposing to do is very similar to the proposals in the Scottish hate crime bill, but in fact go a little bit further. Uh, so for instance, um, uh, the, they want to make, um, uh, at the moment you can be prosecuted under the Public Order Act for stirring up hatred against three protected groups, uh, race, um, sexual orientation, and religion. And those are the only categories which can trigger an investigation under the Public Order Act by the police. And the maximum penalty, if you're found guilty of stirring up hatred against one of those three groups, is seven years in jail. Uh, mm. But it, to, to, to successfully prosecute someone, uh, you have to show intent. And that's quite an important um, uh, threshold, which is quite hard to meet, as with the prosecutions under the Public Order Act for stirring up hatred are not that common at present in England and Wales. So what the Law Commission has proposed is, first of all, it wants to massively enlarge the number of protected groups. I mean, uh, at the very least, it says that they should include um, uh, sex and gender. Um, so you could be prosecuted for stirring up hatred against women, for instance. Um, uh, but in addition, it suggested all sorts of categories that we should consider making protected groups like non-binary people, for instance, um, uh, transvestites, it actually says, cross-dressers, um, punks, goths. I mean, an extraordinarily long list of people it thinks uh, should be protected, should be entitled to special legal protections by the state, whereby you can be prosecuted and jailed for seven years if you're found guilty of stirring up hatred against anyone in any of these protected categories. But in addition, um, it wants to uh, remove the necessity to prove intent and say it'll be sufficient to secure a prosecution merely to show that the words used were likely to stir up hatred, which is a much, much lower bar and makes prosecutions, successful prosecutions, much more likely. And we saw, um, uh, as, um, as Andrew mentioned, in the Darren Grimes and David Starkey case, even at the moment, uh, the police will consider, will investigate you uh, for the crime of stirring up hatred on pretty spurious grounds. Um, so if you're going to give them even more latitude, if you're going to say you don't have to show intent, if you can show that their words are likely to stir up hatred, that will be sufficient to secure a conviction. And there's one more thing they propose, which really does uh, uh, seal this, uh, which is that at the moment, there's a, a dwelling exemption in the Public Order Act, whereby you can't be prosecuted for stirring up hatred against a protected group in the privacy of your own home. So if you say something to your kids, over the supper table or to your wife in the bedroom. Um, uh, you can't be prosecuted for those words. There is this dwelling exemption and that's quite proper. Um, the long arm of the law should not extend into regulating what people say to each other over the dinner table or in the bedroom. Uh, yeah. The Law Commission wants to do away with that exemption. So henceforth, uh, you can be prosecuted for saying something likely to stir up hatred against women uh, at your dinner table. Um, I mean, it, it, this is a hallmark of a totalitarian society. One of the uh, worst things, uh, if you read the documentary eyewitness accounts of living in the Soviet Union and during the Stalin era, one of the worst things was the fear that your children might inform on you. Um, uh, same as in, in, in Nazi Germany, same in, in post-war East Germany. There was this fear within families that siblings, uh, 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 spouses, children could inform on you and you would end up in jail. Um, of course, when I told my children that this was a possibility as a result of the Law Commission's proposals, they started rubbing their hands with glee and started thinking about all the things they could report me for unless I bought them this, that and the other. But, you know, yeah. it, it is no laughing matter. Um, um, uh, so I think we, 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 the Free Speech Union is hoping to uh, make as many people as possible aware of these terrible proposals. I mean, it really is the Scottish hate crime bill on steroids. Yeah. We do whatever we can to derail them before they find their way into the statute books. I was, I was going to mention the Scottish hate crime bill, which is appalling, as you say, it's got all those elements in it. Uh, Mr. Yousaf, big brother Yousaf, you know, and that particular aspect of anything in the home, um, you know, if, if, 
if, if the, in their view, it might stir up um, hatred. Um, and also we're getting into areas, um, you know, very dangerous areas in terms of what, what is hate crime, you know, the definition. To me, it's, it's, it's thought crime. I mean, you, you read 1984, it was never meant to be a manual. Um, uh, but it's almost like it's it's almost happening in all sorts of respects, including like children. Uh, there's a, that episode of the ch children damning one of the characters in 1984, um, and this is this is real. It's actually happening, and uh, it it you know we, we have to combat it and fight it in in every respect. Okay, sorry. Um, who else wants to take that? Maybe the the, the policing aspect, Claire. Do you want to say 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 anything? Uh on well, I mean, you know, I'm sorry to say, but the last group that I would look to to police to get rid of cancel culture is the police at the moment because they're the most enthusiastic enforcers of this climate in many instances. And I think that that in and of itself has completely skewed the picture. And it shows you that what's happened is not, you know, there's a kind of this idea of a kind of weight studenty type guardianist that we can all caricature over there. I, I don't mean it's not got any validity to it, but I think that you'll find that this is a much uh, far greater, uh, has been embraced by sets in, in society that you wouldn't expect or anticipate. And I wanted to um, note that, uh, you know, Toby has given, you know, it's, it's, it's fine to kind of go, Big Brother USA, and, and people go on about the SNP. Well, let me tell you, this Law Commission's um, uh, proposals are far worse and far deeper, um, and they're for the UK. So I think, oh, it's just the Law Commission, what's that? But now I'm in the Lords, I've discovered that, guess what? Everybody loves this Law Commission proposal, right? So there was a question about the misogyny aspect, just the sort of questions I question I asked, I put my name down, but I didn't get taken. Um, but the minister that was responding on behalf of the government made it very clear that they were looking forward to seeing the Law Commission's recommendations, that they knew that they had to change the hate crime situation. And I used a quote during the week, I haven't got it now, it's something like, well, of course we all believe in free speech, but we know that hate speech crosses the line and there can be no free speech without responsibility. So, you know, the Conservative government, let me tell you, free speech is not safe in their hands, right? You go to, uh, if you look at all of the debates, and Darren Grimes' one was used as an example, but the police are policing in a distinctly politicised fashion, and they are definitely have a different attitude to different groups, depending on whether they think they're on the right side and morally on the big questions of the day, which just finally gets me to... Um, the point about being frightened to speak up, so that this relates to policing. One of the questioners mentioned the grooming gangs, um, people being frightened to speak out, or if they went and complained about grooming gangs, um, that they would be, you know, branded Islamophobic. We've already heard recently in evidence in terms of the Manchester Arena bombing, that a number of members of staff were suspicious of one of the, uh, uh, of the bomber, who turned out to be the bomber, but they had their suspicions and they didn't like to report it or intervene because they were worried that they would be seen as Islamophobic. Increasingly, there are areas of life that are effectively verboten. You're not allowed to question. You know what the consequence. Those people who were frightened to go and talk to what or report the would-be bomber in Manchester were not wrong. Because I'll bet you anything, if they had gone to their boss and said there's a young Asian lad standing over there acting suspiciously with a with a, a rucksack, they could well have been their names written down as somebody endorsing a, protect, a particular form of hatred. That'd be as much likely to happen with the police than that they'd go and ask the lad what he was doing. We know this, right? And I think that's what is so frightening for me, but why I think we've got to avoid any sectarianism. You know, the Labour Party call for coronavirus, you know, call for censorship of anyone who says anything 
uh, about vaccines recently, yeah? And you want to be sectarian about the Labour Party because they're so illiberal, you know, they're explicitly called. But the thing is, is that we live under a Conservative government. So the reason I'm mentioning that is because I'm in this company is because I think we've got to realise that this is a cross-party political problem and that the institutional buy-in to this way of approaching the world is so widespread now that it, if, if only it was confined to guardianistas, well, you're going to find it in police forces and in some of the most traditionalist uh, institutions like the National Trust and so on. So we've got a much bigger issue on our hands, and that's why we can't afford to caricature the type of people we're against, but actually have the arguments out more fully, because we're just a lot of people are bought into this. And we're in a minority, we haven't won the arguments in effect. Thanks very much, Claire. I was just going to say, we, we, we started slightly late because of technical problems, but uh, we can run over about 10 minutes about. So, um, uh, Nick, Nick, uh, Andrew is kicked out. He'll, he'll be back in a minute. But do you want to say anything, Nick, on, on those aspects, policing or...? Yep, sure. Um, what you people know. don't know is I, a decade ago, I spent years based in police stations when I worked for Manchester City Council. I was based in different police stations across the city of Manchester, working next to neighbourhood inspectors trying to reduce crime and antisocial behaviour. So I fully know how the police work. I've trained police officers many times as well in community engagement. I was surprised when I started working with the police about how political they are. I thought they were fully independent. The police, high echelons of the police, get their instructions from the local council on what is a priority and what isn't a priority. So if, if the political arena of that area is saying, we need to clamp down on this, but we can let these things go, that's exactly what the police will enforce. They're held to account at monthly, quarterly meetings on what they've done, on who they've prosecuted, on who they've arrested. You look at the stats um, and they're held to account for that. So they're, they're driven in a particular direction by national government, but also by local government. So we need to understand that. Hence why we see different groups being policed in different ways, because they're being told that's how you work. And if you want promotion, then you need to do that. Um, and if you want a job outside of the police, that's what you need to do if you want a good reputation. Um, I've seen it many, many times. But for me, I think one of the biggest problems we've got at the moment is there's no political leadership on cancel culture or any of this woke nonsense. There's no leadership whatsoever. Um, my thinking around this now is politicians are always looking for weapons so they can use against their enemies. And this is a cancel culture and using woke speak is a great weapon. And I think they want to keep this as a weapon that they can use. They don't think they're going to fall foul of this, and some of them do but it's a weapon. And the best way, the best example I can give is the TV series, um, I forgot what it's called now, um, but the Seven Kingdoms, well, what was that called? Game of Thrones. Game of, that's it, Game of Thrones, I forgot what it was called. And halfway through the series of that, there was an organization, a religious organization called the Sparrows. And one of the kingdoms used the religious Sparrows to claim, you know, um, control, to claim, um, power and eventually the Sparrows, the religious organization, went so far they turned against the power themselves and they became the power. And that's exactly what we're looking at now. We think politicians think they control what's going on, but it's going to go across the line and then be uncontrollable. And I think that's that's my real worry. And, and that's why we need some political leadership on this. Because if we've got if it looks like politicians are scared of this, then the general public should be terrified if their politicians are too scared to stand up. And that's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for some politicians to stand up. Yeah, thank you very much, Nick. Um, I, I was just going to throw in, there's another question, Brian Anderson, to uh, all panellists about the politicisation of the educational system from primary through to post-grad and, and what... Um, what role that plays, the actual education system. Um, I don't know if Toby wants to uh, comment on that with your educational background as uh, get the ball rolling on that question. Yeah, I, I like um, Nick's analogy between the woke cult and the 
religious cults in Game of Thrones called the Sparrows. Um, I think there is a religious dimension to um, uh, this particular recent manifestation of hard left Marxist ideology. I know Claire doesn't like me using the word Marxist. Let's just call it <laughs> hard left um, ideology. Um, and, um, uh, and you see the way in which the cult operates. It captures different institutions. Um, and um, uh, Margaret Thatcher's comment, I think, is relevant here. What's surprising has been how easily captured those institutions are. Um, so the New York Times, um, uh, earlier this year, um, uh, the, 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 they, they published a comment piece by a senator um, at the height of the civil unrest following the Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, and um, this uh, Republican senator, Tom Cotton, uh, said that uh, Trump should, uh, shouldn't hesitate uh, to send in the army to restore order, if necessary, if the police weren't able to do it. Um, and um, the op-ed editor of the New York Times who published this piece ended up being fired because this piece caused such outrage, both amongst the junior staffers on the New York Times and more widely uh, amongst their allies um, on Twitter. Um, and Barry Weiss, one of the few right of center people who actually worked on the New York Times comment page, resigned shortly afterwards and said that New York, the New York Times was essentially edited by Twitter now. Um, and we see this in one uh, liberal institution after another. If you look at the great American universities, uh, they've very easily and very quickly been captured by this woke cult. Um, and I think we've seen the police have begun to be captured by the woke cult through organizations like Stonewall, Gendered Intelligence, they deliver training now to the police, just as they do to the court and tribunal service. Um, uh, they, have, they, have, they have done a good job of, of capturing the criminal justice system, uh, which means that their ideology is now enforced uh, uh, in the courts and by the police. And I think we've seen this in education too. Um, uh, one of the, um, we, we frequently get written to by parents at the Free Speech Union uh, expressing their concern that their children are essentially being taught critical race theory uh, in assembly in the classroom. Um, they're essentially being told that the Black Lives Matter view of British society, which is that it's riddled with racism from top to bottom, uh, they completely misguidedly say that the police are, um, uh, are, are systemically racist when actually, um, as Nick just pointed out, um, uh, if anything, um, the police have been captured by anti-racist um, ideologues. Um, uh, uh, but this view, this jaundiced view of British society as being riddled with racism, this, this message that is being pumped out to children in particularly in cities like Manchester, London, Liverpool, that if you're born with a brown or a black skin, um, you are disadvantaged and that you have the odds stacked against you. Um, you, you are effectively living in a society uh, which uh, is um, uh, beholden to white supremacy, that nothing's really changed since the era of the transatlantic slave trade uh, and so on and so forth. This, in, this, this, this creates an incredibly divisive sectarian atmosphere. I mean, the, the, the people in the Law Commission who have brought forward these proposals and the people who support them, like the Conservative Minister in the House of Lords, Claire just referenced, they think that bringing in these laws, which are gonna give certain groups special legal protections, is gonna promote social cohesion. It's going to make our society a more peaceful, a nicer, more mutually respectful place to live. It's gonna have precisely the opposite effect. It drives division and sectarianism. It creates this culture of grievance and victimhood. It's the last thing that's likely to make our society more cohesive. And we do see it, I'm afraid, uh, not just in universities, but increasingly in secondary schools. And the advice we give to parents who write to us um, uh, to complain that their children are being taught this uh, but very poisonous one-sided view of British society is that if that is happening in your school, then the teachers in your school are in breach of the 1996 Education Act, which says that if children are taught politically contentious 
uh, things in the classroom, those things have to be taught in a balanced way. They can't be taught in a one-sided way. You can't just expose children in the classroom to one particular ideological point of view. Nothing wrong with, 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 with teaching them a particular ideological point of view, but it should be counterbalanced by an alternative view. So if you're gonna teach them that Britain is a systemically racist society in which black and brown people will forever be second-class citizens, you also want someone on the other side of the argument with a more optimistic, positive view of contemporary Britain, talking about the progress we've made when it comes to race relations, particularly in the last 25 years, uh, and so on. Um, uh, so schools are acting unlawfully if they are teaching this very one-sided view of these issues. And if that's happening in your school, I would, I, what we do, we recommend that parents write to their MPs to complain and copy in Kemi Badenoch, the equalities minister, and say to their MP, I want you to get an answer from the equalities minister about what they're gonna do about this. And I think Kemi Badenoch uh, is one of the few conservative ministers who is minded to do something about this and ensure that schools don't continue to behave unlawfully and pump out this incredibly divisive uh, sectarian ideology. Thank you. Just on Kemi Badnock, I mean, I did hear her um, condemning this, uh, you know, in the House. She's been very strong on it, actually, and 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 she has made it clear it's illegal, and she'll act on it. I think she's been wonderful. <laughs> it's very reassuring, actually. Um, Nick and Andrew, do you want to just say a few things? I, I, Claire has to go any moment. So did you want to say anything and run, Claire, just before? I get the other two in uh, you're you're on mute um, i've got five i've got five ten minutes max so it, I, yeah, i'm trying to run we'll wind up in five minutes is there anything you want to add in on the educational front and then uh, we'll yeah i mean I, I i did actually but i just on kemi i mean the the thing about kemi badenoch is what is shocking is that is is that she's one of the few people that's the thing i mean I, i'm look I don't, I try not to come at this from either a left or a right. I mean, I understand, by the way, that the left are associated with cancel culture more than anyone else. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be defensive about that because I'm originally from the left. But I'm more wanted to put the warning out that I'm shocked that some people who are associated with kind of more libertarian right approach have been so bloody useless. That's what I'm disappointed about. I, 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 I thought even at an opportunist level, that the government might be rather more keen on clamping down on some of this. And I think that Kemi Badenoch has been great, as Toby's explained. And I think pressure should be put on and more government ministers, but there's some, you know, there's others, you know, there's backbenchers, people like Ben Bradshaw and all the rest of it. But, you know, it's, it's surprising how many conservative, you know, with such a large majority, conservative members, you know, front and backbench, just want to kind of look the other way when you raise it, you know what I mean? It's almost like they considered the culture wars aspect of these discussions as being like, we don't want to be associated with that because it's a bit like the nasty party bit. You know, they don't want to be seen, they want to be seen to be on the right side. And I'm afraid that's very dangerous. So on education, there is a, you know, this started in many ways through the educational institutions. Young people are no doubt introduced to the notions of what is the correct views on things by their teachers in many instances, you know, and also they're, I, I wrote a short book on this, but they're also kind of in, imbued with the sense that if they hear certain words or ideas, they will be psychologically damaged by it. I mean, that is a widespread way that it's understood. Right? So, so anyway, I've got loads to say on it, but, but could I urge us all in a way to, you know, to just, to, to not caricature the other side, but take all these things seriously. I think, you know, when I hear Toby going through all these things that are happening, I, I mean, I try and follow it and I'm very supportive of the free speech. Union. I just don't people realize, people realize how bad it is. I think everybody knows you have to walk on eggshells, but there's a lot of attacks coming down the line at the moment, as Toby has indicated in terms of the law and so on. And I just think that this is the fight of a lifetime. And it's very difficult because we've got the bloody other fight of the lifetime going on, which is COVID. But the difficulty we've got is that there, it's become 
acceptable to say that there is, should be no debate about whether vaccination should be mandatory. There should be no debate about social distancing should be, because we've already softened everybody up on free speech. So this sort of notion that you can't challenge the science, there is no debate, anyone who says anything should be delegitimized de and so on. That's already, as it were, being introduced to young people into schools, this idea that there's only one view, you shouldn't debate things, certain ideas are dangerous. I mean, it's only one step from saying that if you hear some, that you want somebody to be no platform because it'll cause you psychological damage and it'll cause violence to you if you hear, you know, psychological violence to you if you hear certain phrases and words. It's only one short step to then saying, if you go and say this about coronavirus, you're killing grannies. Do you know what I mean? That words, ideas kill people. And that's what they're saying in this. They're actually saying that somebody like Toby and lockdown skeptics is leading to death and should be banned because misinformation kills. And But you can see, you can trace it back. So fight of our lives and they're connected. Yeah, thanks very much. Kat. If you have to rush, thank you so much for your contribution. I, I don't want to hold you back because- I, you... I wouldn't mind because I've got to go practice or yes. panic. Uh, or do, you, do you want to take off? Thanks so much for- Thanks everyone. Sorry yeah, to have messed you around. Okay, yeah, thanks well, everyone. Really good and good luck anyway. Thanks and, for organising this and inviting I'm, me. Take I'm care. I'm sure the uh, viewers will shoot up as, uh, with you with you on there. So, take, <laughs> so if we go now, um, to, just to Nick and Andrew uh, commenting on the question. There's one other thing about editors, actually. Uh, Ian Taylor was asking about editors, you know, why are they so weak? I don't know if you want to touch on that, but um, Andrew, do you want to go first and then Nick? Yeah, yeah, most certainly. I mean, I mean you know, you could, these days you've got students in increasing numbers being frightened to speak out and speak their mind. Just the fear, the, the, the repercussions. You know, you've got hate crimes and hate incidences where there's there's no proof has to, there at all. You just have to perceive that something is motivated by. Uh, uh, uh. Oh dear. Maybe he's been censored. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 that's another whole another debate. Um, Threw it out. Andrew, you're back. Sorry, we lost you for a bit. Uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, uh, the um, hate crimes, no proof. Yeah, there's no proof. It just has to be perceived that, mm. uh, that what you have said or done is, is motivated by hate. You must be believed. Uh, I mean, there's all sorts of things. The Scottish hate crime bill, which we've we, which we've touched on, is really pernicious. I mean, I, I've spoken to people in East Germany, you know, who lived under the Stasi. Uh, I mean, they didn't even want to see their files for fear of not wanting to read that it was that neighbor down the road who had reported them. Um, it, was, it, was, it was that sort, sort, of, sort of feeling. I mean, you've even got, well, touching on um, trigger warnings and things like that that Claire was, um, was, was touching on. There was one, I think it was at the University of Glasgow on a theology course, there was a trigger warning that they may be upset by, by looking at the crucifixion. Well, if you're a theology student, surely you know about the crucifixion. Um, but all these things, I mean, I mean, children are just being brought up these days with lots of tick boxes of you must do this, you mustn't do that. Uh, you can't possibly think for yourself. And, and if you're, you know, if you feel that you're going to be triggered, if you feel it's going to affect your, your emotional well-being, then, then everyone must, must, must agree with yeah. you. That, that is the sort of society that, that we're living in at the moment. And that is very much what we've got to fight against. Just uh, briefly on the Stasi, I was there in 91 in East Germany and a, a German politician said that uh, one third was spying on the two thirds in, in mm. some it, giving information in some sort of way. Really scary scenario. Uh, Nick, do you just want to finish yes. up because uh, we, we need to go pretty shortly, but thanks so much. Uh, if you go now on those. Yeah, sure. So um, talking about education, I think we need to we need to look at universities. Um, for me, that's where this started for me uh, many decades ago. And we spent decades ignoring it. We spent decades laughing at these silly students who complained about this and complained about that. And what we didn't realise, or what we should have realised, was these students, once they qualify and go into the real world, start taking real jobs. And some of them are completely brainwashed, but the vast majority of them are not. But we've, but we've sowed a seed into their into their mentality. So as this has developed, with these university students have got into the, into the, the wider world and they're there. 
Now, this is going to take one or two generations to undo, but we need to start at the universities. And how that's done, I've no idea. Do we link it to funding? Do we link it, link it to student grants so we don't give students grants if they're doing the silly courses of gender studies? I'm not sure how any of this works, but until we get the universities on the right path, this just continues. Thanks very much, Nick. Uh, um, I mean, one, one idea I was suggesting is political diversity. I, I know a number of universities and it's horrifying, uh, you know, they go along with all of this stuff. Um, but, you know, political diversity, I mean, 80, 90% are now left wing, inverted commas, and that's not acceptable. You know, they get grants from the public sector from a conservative government now. And in my view, you know, you shouldn't sort of have to dictate the right wing views, but there should be a balanced approach, shouldn't there? You know, in a balanced view, and they should have to prove that as part of their criteria. They, they're into diversity in all sorts of other areas. Um, anyway, I better call a halt there, but thank you so much for all your contributions and, and for the work you're doing and the courage you've shown, you know, Nick, Toby, Andrew, and Claire, who's gone now, but, you know, it, it does take courage, but I do believe that if you stand up to bullies, as I said before, um, that's the way you've got to do it. You know, you go along with bullying and, and that, that's too many institutions are jumping to this. Uh, and we need to show a bit of backbone, a bit of spine. And, um, you know, I think that's the lesson that comes out of that. But, you know, if we can work together more closely and actually help each other out and, and stop that sense of isolation and being on your own. Um, which I'm well aware of, then I think that's a real step forward. So thank you so much for your time for, for, for backing the Freedom Association. This will be put up on the website in due course. Uh, and thank you for your contributions and stay in touch and we can work together in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, David.